Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Today is day five of Lifestyle Medicine Week. Each week we meet a new doctor that is board certified in lifestyle medicine that is also plant-based with a different and interesting topic. And to introduce today's new doctor is Dr. Madhuri Paidaseti. Hi. So thank you, Chef AJ. Um, so I'm Dr. Madhuri Paidiseti. I'm an ethical vegan and an animal liberation activist. I live in Chicago and I love lifestyle medicine, whole food, plant-based nutrition and dancing. I am extremely honored to introduce our chief guest, Dr. Mitika Kanabar. Dr. Kanabar is an addiction medicine physician helping patients with substance abuse disorders in rural California. She completed her addiction medicine fellowship from Stanford University. She is triple boarded in addiction medicine, lifestyle medicine, and family medicine. As a member of the NEXT Committee of the International Society of Addiction Medicine, Dr. Kanabar is involved in international networking, collaboration, and mentorship for early addiction professionals. As a part of her outreach efforts in the Indian subcontinent, Dr. Kanabar has spoken in public forums on the harm of process addictions and problematic internet use. Dr. Kanabar has a keen interest in lifestyle modification for chronic diseases and application of the same in patients with substance use disorders. I know Dr. Kanabar personally. She loves to grow food and knows Sanskrit, an ancient Indian language. Now, I would like to warmly welcome our dear friend, Dr. Mithika Kanabar, to speak about the less known aspects of lifestyle medicine, especially curtailing unhealthy substance use and mindful use of technology. Thank you so much, Dr. Paidisati. That was a very warm and amazing welcome. And thank you, Chef AJ, for having me here today on Chef AJ Live. I'm so excited. I'm so excited because this isn't something we've talked about a lot on the show. And I'm so fascinated by addiction. I work with people that suffer from food addictions. And I find the whole topic fascinating and interesting. And I, I've only met one other addiction medicine doctor. Maybe even talk about that as a, special, as a specialty. Who comes to see you? Why? And, and why were you interested in becoming an addiction medicine doctor as well as a lifestyle medicine doctor? Wonderful. So both of these topics, addiction and lifestyle are very close to my heart. And I have to say addiction and lifestyle are also very parallel to each other. And in, in what way I can elaborate. So addiction medicine uh, is, you know, is a up and coming specialty. It just got recognized by the American Board of Medical Specialties in 2015. And it was pretty late to the game. But if you think about it, throughout time, we have always known about addictions, right? You look at any of the ancient scriptures or, uh, you know, mythology, whatever, you are going to have addiction, gambling, all of these other things uh, quoted in that. So how I got introduced to addiction medicine? Well, I worked at a safety net hospital uh, in Minneapolis as a family medicine resident. And I would see uh, these patients who are suffering from alcohol use disorder, you know, come in, get detox, go home, come in again. And uh, it was always this, uh, how do we help them better sort of a question. And one day when I was an intern, I was told to go and interview this patient who was not willing to talk. And I go there and this patient is nicely having this whole conversation with this other doctor whom nobody had called, right? Because we were still like the people who are well, the welcoming committee or the, or the you know, the initial people talking to this patient. And so, and then that doctor had this white coat on and she left and I'm, I went to see the patient and I'm like, hold on, um, who was this, that doctor? And she's like, I don't know, she just left. So I went and found that doctor and she said, oh, 
I just talked to her about how she can get help for her addiction. And we have a clinic just across the street. And, and that's why she's, she's, you know, very glad to finally get some respite because the, unfortunately that is the situation. And I'm like, yeah, well, how can I learn more? And she's like, well, let's do, let's have you do an elective with us next year when you get elective. So that's how I did my elective at the Hennepin County Medical Center. And then I also got to do an elective at Hazel Dunn. Uh, uh, which is one of the premier addiction medicine institutes in the country. And I was like, you know, you are helping people at the time that they needed the most. And you get a lot of time to talk to your patients and go into the bottom of what exactly is going on. It's not your average five minute doctor visit. So that's kind of what drew me to that. And I applied for fellowships and then uh, very lucky to have worked with uh, Dr. Lemke at Stanford for my uh, addiction medicine fellowship. And since then, I have been working in California and uh, helping people the best I can. That is so fascinating. And that is so funny that I literally just contacted Dr. Lemke two days ago. People might remember her from the documentary Social Networking and to be on the show. Is addiction genetic? Is it environmental? Is it both? Because, you know, I think back to like the Stone Age. Did people always have addictions or susceptibility to them? Yes. So part of it is definitely genetic, right? You have a susceptibility to addiction, but that does not mean you have to go down that road. Um, it, a lot of it is environmental and how you, you know, develop your coping skills. And beyond that, at some point, the substance takes away your power to choose. You know, it hijacks your brain, it bypasses your frontal lobe, and you cannot make the decisions that you really want to make in the minute. And that's how it's a disease that kind of takes over your brain. And you need a lot of help to come out of it. That is so profound. We have to repeat that the substance takes away your power to choose. That is why I tell people that suffer with food addictions don't have that food in the house. And they say, well, my kid wants it. My husband wants it. They don't understand. The substance takes away their power to choose and they have no choice but to eat it. Uh, yeah, so most of the addiction medicine literature is more about substance use. And now only like these behavioral addictions are coming into play. So as far as uh, food is concerned, you know, there are some uh, definitely we generally look at it as a binge eating disorder. And yes, that starts manifesting the moment you stop using your other substance of no choice, whether it's alcohol or opioid or whatever, you'll end up seeing either some anorexia or some binge eating when a person is in recovery. So yeah. A lot of things come into play there. And I completely agree with you. Uh, I think I can just uh, do a talk about how we need to have better boundaries as women and like be more assertive in our own households. It is so hard to do, easier said than done. How you can take baby steps and, you know, get uh, some, um, some independence on what you stock in your pantry. Yeah, that would, that, I come back and give that talk because that would be just wonderful. Yeah. Uh, I would be happy to. That's kind of one of my pet peeves. Like, you know, I can't help it. Everybody wants this and that. And, you know, I, 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 live, in, I live in a multi-generational home and I see how it is a negotiation. That's right. I, and I believe that anything can be negotiated. And I also believe that it, the, a, the, a loving family member will support the one that has the problem. They should, at least they should, the one that's in recovery, whatever the addiction. And, you know, when it's, I think people understand like alcohol addiction, you know, or cocaine addiction. And they know that, well, hey, if mom's a cocaine addict, we don't do cocaine, we shouldn't do cocaine at all, but definitely don't keep it in the house. But with food, it's so loosey goosey because if one person doesn't have it, they don't have the empathy or the understanding of the person that does. And I think that's a lot with every addiction. The people that are lucky enough to really don't have ones that, I think everybody has some, but the ones that aren't impacting their life in a meaningful way, they kind of like look at the people that have them as like, like a personality flaw or like, oh, well, you just have no willpower when they don't understand addiction is a real thing. It's a powerful thing. Absolutely, Chef AJ. And that's kind of one of the things that drew me to lifestyle medicine in the first place, because, you know, it's kind of okay for people to talk about other addictions and other things. But when it comes to like obesity, overweight, chronic disease, it kind of, even the medical uh, literature or even the general thing is that, okay, this person kind of let herself go or let himself go. And they have this moral failure. They did it to themselves. And, uh, you know, the 
kind of almost like, okay, they are going to be on medications for the rest of their lives. So when we look at addiction in general, our approach to patients is always biopsychosocial. What all is going on in their lives outside of that one encounter that they have with you in your clinic? And when it comes to a lifestyle medicine, it's about the same. And we have the six pillar approach, which also includes nutrition on top of the exercise, the sleep, the stress relationship, all of that, that we already talk about in addiction. So that's kind of what led me to a lifestyle medicine, which was one of your previous questions. And uh, I, I, went for the, I went for one of the conferences and I was like, hey, this sounds doable. This sounds, you know, something interesting. And also at the same time, it appeals to something we all of us know, right? This is what your grandma or great grandma would have said, like, you know, you eat well, live well and, you know, do your job. So at the end of the day, it also appeals to some of like the Eastern philosophy and I, it was a natural draw for me. And I have to say, you know, I got my board certification and since then the lifestyle medicine community has been so nice. Uh, and uh, it, it's like, okay, you find your tribe. Nice. Absolutely. So we didn't have process addiction before we had technology, right? So process addictions, uh, good question, Chef Age. So uh, process addictions can be anything that is a non-substance addiction, right? So those are all like behavioral addictions. So if you think about it, you can um, always uh, have this idea of there's always been some kind of gambling, right? There has always been some kind of compulsion or the other, but yes, the most of the process addictions that we are seeing now are related to technology. Um, one of the uh, oldest uh, Indian books has uh, this whole episode where gambling causes the downfall of a family. So it has been in literature for thousands of years, gambling itself. And, you know, sometimes it is seen separately from the other addictions uh, because of that. Um, but uh, computer gaming is new. Internet gaming with, with or without connection uh, to the Internet, you know, is new. And of course, uh, overuse of social media, overuse of your smartphones, so this is all emerging. Can you learn to manage a process addiction though? Because I find that at least with, you know, with food and alcohol, abstinence is the answer because I, I don't know how to teach an alcoholic to moderate alcohol or a food addict to moderate things like, you know, sugary, fatty, salty treats. But people at some point, you know, need to probably check their phone or they want to watch this show, but then they don't want to be sucked into like eight hours on Facebook because they're watching this show. Absolutely. So here's the, here's the way to look at it, right? Uh, for substance uh, use disorders, yes, you're going to say don't use the substance, but also there's a growing uh, idea of like harm reduction. Even if you are cutting back, you are at least doing something rather than waiting for this idea of abstinence to kick in. So there is more and more literature for harm reduction and medications available for harm reduction for substance use disorder. So it's not on abstinence only anymore. Likewise, when, when you think about, you know, binge eating disorder or anorexia or whatever, food is at the end of the day, something that's needed for sustenance. So you are going to use food to live. You can't stop eating, right? So the same way when you are dealing with technology, there can be some boundaries that you put around your technology use and cut it down. Now, whether you have an addiction or you have a, you know, right now it's not recognized as a proper addiction. It's more like problematic internet use. Uh, and, you know, maybe overuse of gaming, but gambling is probably the only process addiction that is recognized at this point. So with all of that, is there a way that you can cut it down and keep it okay? And I would say, yes, in fact, uh, you know, I'm a big lover of technology, right? If there were no technology, we, you and I would not be having this conversation right now. And same way, uh, you know, with, with the pandemic, people have been able to send aid or do consults internationally for people suffering with COVID. And all of that has been made available by technology. So big fan of technology. Yes, we should have more mindful use. And I think we need to go a little bit broader than what I am doing with my device as to where we are going as a society when we think about uh, overuse of screens. Are more people susceptible? I mean, because I see even within families, you know, to, to having any addiction, but maybe a process addiction. Or and does the age matter? Because I see I see kids like I mean, they're one year old and they're they're like on an iPhone at one. I didn't get one till I was sixty. <laughs> I, I hear you, Chef Ajay. So you know, susceptible. 
is you know anybody can get used to you know having a device to cope with their feelings right and all of us can right at the end of the day what drives any addiction one is the high you get from the use so like say you tweeted something or you put something on facebook and you got a number of likes and that is going to be variable so that is your hook and then later on you are like okay if i invite more people to be my facebook friends i will get more likes and so sets up the cycle so that is one thing you're getting this pleasure feeling like oh people like me or people like what i'm saying and the second part which is more later on you keep using these devices for longer and longer it's it, those likes are not going to touch here it's like uh, okay whatever they liked it and so what maybe some up to some extent it works but beyond that it's kind of how do i not feel bad about a certain situation what they what we call as negative reinforcement which means that there's something negative happening in my life i got this bad email i did some boo boo at work somebody said something somebody cut me off in traffic i need to sit with my phone and detox at the end of the day it's uh, that is the problematic behavior right because now you are using it just to keep from feeling your feelings through the day how bad is it really like you hear about like like people like committing suicide that are you know on social media because they how bad is this mess that we're in right now right so so there are two aspects of this one is like up to 10% of like us teenagers are supposedly hooked to their screens now all of these are always approximate right uh the good studies are still lacking and that it we may have a higher number than that and when it comes to like you know people saying hey i cannot do without my phone why did you take my phone away and having these unfortunate never events as we call it right this should never have happened they may have some comorbidity so there might be some other psychiatric issue going on whether it is you know major depression bipolar disorder schizophrenia what all is going to come into play and if you think about it a little bit more it is uh, these children who are suffering who are drawn to this world where they could be anybody else so we need to know from a they need to have a proper psychiatric evaluation and diagnosis yeah so i mean what does a parent do like who who do they see their primary doctor i mean you don't just automatically go to an addiction doctor or do you so this is a very good question again uh, uh, chef aj so yes uh, generally most addiction places you can self refer and uh, you can say hey you know i want to talk about this and at the most you know you'll see somebody like me or uh, you know who has expertise in addiction medicine and we will be like uh, no you just have some overuse you do not meet criteria for addiction uh, and send you home like very few are actually going to need the services because a part of this like you said it's like a part of your daily life so most uh, most people can definitely just talk to their pediatrician or their primary care doctor and uh, get help in that way like hey you know my my son or my daughter is spending you know x number of hours online and he is failing in his grades what do you think we should do next and that's where the conversation should begin because that's the most easily accessible avenue you know where is parental control come in because when i think about all these people now that are addicted to sugar they were given sugar as a young child and i see parents doing the same thing with you know i see kids that have been raised without sugar and they don't have these food addictions and it's the same thing with the ipad and the phone i mean you know my feeling is if you're not old enough to like get a job to buy a thousand dollar iphone what are you giving it to, like why is a six year old getting this you know i had a like i said i was 60 before i got my first iphone <laughs> I love this. <laughs> you are on point chef AJ. Like what are we doing? So, it, you know, when they look at studies, there are some of the studies that actually compare the caregiver's use of phones and the child's use of phones. So like there's a study that says if the caregiver of a toddler is using a lot of screen time, the child is going to end up having less sleep. So can you believe that? Like, you know, caregiver's use of phone versus the child's use of sleep. So like that is kind of like how I said the conversations need to be bigger than just this environment because um what all are we needed like now everybody has been working from home uh for over a year and the boundaries between work and home have decreased so like it's you know what is going on like you know are you stretching your work day into the night and when that when the child is trying to talk to you are you on your phone there's one thing the other part is you know when i had my own children uh, i was like looking up these baby forums so they, apparently there's always this uh, 
uh, a race between grandparents, if you may, who's going to buy them what toy. And that up to some extent, uh, it's kind of considered a toy, right? Like, oh, the grand, that grandma bought, her, bought him like this so-called interactive noisy toy. I'm going to buy him an iPad or I'm going to buy her an iPhone. So it becomes like the struggle of who's going to give the, the shiny gift first. And, you know, we need to take a step back and say, is this really needed at this age? Nice, nice. So what, what, when I was little, like we had to go outside and play if we wanted to do anything. There was, I mean, there was barely, I grew up like out when there was black and white TV and you had to get up to change the channel. So nobody did because we were too lazy to get up. That I remember like being a child when the first color TV came into the house and the first remote control. But for the most part, our interactions were going outside and playing with the neighbors, with the friends. And Kids don't do that anymore. Absolutely, Chef Ed. So, you know, the, there's, there are recommendations, right? If you look up CDC or, any, or even AAP, it's going to say like children need to have one hour of vigorous physical activity a day. And is that really happening? I don't know. But when they look at studies of uh, severe obesity or obesity in children from two to five years of age, of course, social determinants of health are the most important, whether you know, you grew up uh, with less economic uh, uh, options with, uh, you know, with uh, less educated parents or in a minority background, you're going to have high incidence of obesity. But one of the other associations they found was more than four hours of daily screen time. And so it's kind of like, which came first? Like it's because say, if I'm a mom, I'm running three jobs and maybe two of them are at home and I, do, I cannot afford childcare, then that's my option for childcare, right? That is a reality. So how do we begin renegotiating? I moved uh, into a rural community and I went, when I went to see even daycare spaces, like some of the home daycares were like, yeah, yeah, we put these videos on all day because they're supposedly enter uh, educational videos on YouTube. And that's what the caregiver is doing. And if you have a limited income, you do not have many options for childcare. And so that conversation needs to happen. Like, what is that? Is there a regulation? How much screen time can even these home daycares give? So like, you know, uh, thankfully I was able to find some childcare where I can put down the rules, like no screen time with my children. Because what we are seeing more and more is that these children who are, you know, like you said, they are not interacting with each other. They are not interacting with their caregiver, the parent, the guardian, the grandma, whoever. They are busy interacting with their screens. They are having a, a, a lot of language delay. So they are not being able to speak, right? So, and the bigger uh, problem with this is you are not exercising, yes. You are not developing your hand-eye coordination. You're not developing your balance. And the biggest problem of all of this is when I feel upset, I can go play a game. That coping skill is a problem. It's a problematic coping skill. It's not like, okay, I will pout in the corner, then I will try to talk to myself, get up and get going. Or maybe, you know, we can introspect. Maybe this guy did something or we had a fight and how did we resolve that conflict? All of that is going out of the window. So that is problematic. So that's in the toddler age group and the middle schoolers, uh, you know, especially with COVID, all of their education was online. And then uh, because of uh, staying at home, they were also asked to like take part in these uh, games online after class so that they can interact. But unfortunately, some of them, what happened is they can't find themselves stop playing the game. And then when you look at older age group, uh, you know, it's like more and more of social media, a lot of bullying, all of that that happens online that also comes into play. And, oh, you know, overall, what it is that we are hoping to do, are we hoping to raise kids who can, you know, tolerate a certain amount of stress, find out their own way through a sexual situation, or press a button to feel good in that moment? Yeah, it's, it's, it's so hard. Like, I, you know, I remember the last, I, don't live in LA anymore. So I haven't seen my nieces and nephews in a while, but I remember the last time that we had dinner together and they're like in their twenties, early thirties now. And my, myself, my husband and their parents were all at the table and they're the whole time. I mean, they're, they're not even present. They're like the whole dinner time. They're just on their phone. You know, it's, it's just so bizarre. And they don't even, and even the kids today, they even say, well, we don't, we don't get together. We just, you know, we just text. It's like, it's, isn't that going to affect like our future as a species when people are just interacting now through technology? What if one day it stops working, then what are people going to do? 
A wonderful question, Chef Ajay. And this is, you know, when I was doing my talks in India, like just for public use, you know, like, you know, what, where are we going with technology? Back then, that's what patients, you know, not patients, parents would come and tell me, like, you know, we and these other moms and dads got together and we said, you guys need to spend time together. And we would have a bunch of 16-year-olds in a, in a room. and uh, Each one of them is on their own iPad and they are just doing their own thing. So they are not even looking up and talking to each other. So... I think the conversation needs to begin much earlier than that. We need to have what we call the family media policy, right? If you are asking the child to put away the phone, so should you, right? It's like, it's a two-way street. And then as the children grow older, let them have a say. You know, the sometimes what it is that you let it go for long and then you are like at 16 when they are using uh, Facebook for 12 to 14 hours a day, you want to take the phone away. And that is like the absolute wrong thing to do. You can try first harm reduction and then take it from there. Like what it is that you're willing to do, what it is that I'm willing to do, because what happens, what we are seeing more and more as the criteria come, become clear for gaming or internet use is that if you take away that phone or whatever, they have this profound sadness that sets upon them. And that's not what we are hoping. We are just hoping that they are able to you know, move out, become good citizens. And most of them will be able to. It's just the people who are more susceptible are going to have a problem. Is there any way to know before your susceptibility? What, I mean, maybe the parents could give them a test to see if they should even get them. And also, you know, I mean, like I, we couldn't have dessert in my house unless we ate our vegetables. And so, I mean, shouldn't there be like some things like, yeah, you can have this hour of screen time, but you got to do your homework first. You got to do your chores first. Should I, and, and again, I guess the age of the, the child is it's going to depend on that. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. So uh, definitely like if you had your one hour of actual physical play and if you have, if you've done your homework, then yes, you can have some amount of limited screen time that you've decided in your family media policy, but yes, not without it, or it could be limited to certain days. It could be like, okay, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you are just going to focus on your schoolwork, do extra. And the other days you can have access to screen times. Now, all of that is good. Um, on the other hand, like I said, like a lot of parents come and tell me like our slip swim classes, our other extracurricular activities, everything has this group on, on uh, signal or telegram or WhatsApp that uh, the children and the parents have to keep following and it, things change quickly. So how do you decrease that? overuse of technology for these small things that could have been pre-decided so that you are not required to be on the phone 24 seven. Right. The thing that bothers me so much is that these things were designed to be addictive. I know that they're enormously helpful. And like you say, without the technology, we couldn't be connecting right now, but social media, it was designed just like processed food. It wasn't an accident. And that's what gets me so angry. So wonderful question, Chef Ajay. So as far as see, at the end of the day, uh, I do like when it comes to food, I, I do like to think about it from a mindful eating perspective. And as far as technology is concerned, as, as far as the startup world is concerned, you know, they are at the end of the day, they are business owners. Their job is to make money. Their job is not to uh, just solve life problems for you. Yes, they're sol solving a problem, which is why these apps are popular, right? Uh, you wanted to have a way to uh, connect with each other. You have all of these social media companies. You wanted to have a way to do some easy calling. That's why you have these other apps that you keep in your network, right? But it, at the end of the day, them as a startup, they have to have revenue, they have to grow and they have to make some, uh, some ideas. So yes, they are designed to hook you in because the more eyeballs they, that they get, the better they are access to funds to grow. And so they are doing their job. So what is your job? Your job as a person you know, to live well is to have mindful eating, right? You have to understand that you are this consciousness who's having this bodily experience to do your job, whether it is to do your karma, whatever you want to call it. And so how does food play into it? You have to think about it in that aspect. Similarly, you are a student, you are um, uh, a working executive. Your job is to do, make the most of the opportunity that is in front of you. That is your job, your daily life, how you're supporting other people and to have more mindful use of the technology. Nice. Here's a funny comment by Jesse, and maybe it wasn't meant to be funny, but I think I'm confused as to whether I should disconnect now or stay connected to find out how to disconnect. 
Absolutely. Right. Because uh, so if this is helping you in any way, stay connected. If you feel this is of not use to you, then it is your decision what you do. <laughs> right. So that's how you say what is going to help me. Uh, how is this going to help my lived experience? Is it adding or subtracting from my lived experience? Right. Mandy says, well, what if the family members are addicted, but not acknowledging that they are? That is the most uh, common scenario, isn't it? It's like, no, no, no. My kid has that problem with social media. I'm fine, except, you know, every bell and whistle on the phone is going off every few seconds, right? So one of the ways you could do that, and there are some apps that can monitor your family screen time. So like you can have uh, some of those monitors available where, you know, you get a real uh, idea of how many hours you're spending on the phone. So that may be a point of, hey, let's all of us watch our screen time this week and look at the average on Sunday. Yeah, that's great. I, uh, speaking of apps, you had mentioned that you're creating one and that you want to give some people like an opportunity to try it. And we put that in the show notes. Maybe you could talk about what that is because I, I signed up for it right away. I wasn't even sure what it was, but if you sent it, I figured it's going to be good. Wonderful. Thank you so much for the support. So it's, it's a very, it's a very funny journey if I, if I may go into that. Uh, so back a couple of years ago, when I started, you know, talking about addiction, what happened was, you know, I wanted to go to these places and talk about the substance use and other issues. And uh, most places were not, uh, you know, not very particular about talking about mental health and addiction in general, because it's such a taboo subject. So one of the suggestions I got was, can you talk about process addictions? And I'm like, absolutely, I'm trained in that. And that's how I started talking about overuse of technology, how we are all tied to our screens. And uh, that's how the, that's how I got a lot of feedback. Hey, there's a need to develop something to help us cut back because most of us want to have more balance in our lives. And how can we go about that? So that has been uh, a journey so far. And uh, just, just for fun, we actually had a couple of trials where we helped people uh, with this uh, a fun way of cutting back and you know reconnecting with things that matter in life and uh, and that was successful and they said hey can you uh, appify it so that's kind of what I'm helping uh, the team build right now so it's going to be called screen win and uh, we have a beta version that we should be getting in a, in a, in about a couple of months and so if you want I'm happy to share it for free that is very cool. Thank you so much. I put the link in the show notes. By show notes, I mean below the video on YouTube. So if you're watching on Facebook, you'll have to go to YouTube to see the show notes. You know what I was thinking? You know how like when people have uh, problems with alcohol and they're on probation, but they didn't lose their license, they, they, they have to like blow into something just for their car to start. What if we had that with our phone? Like, like if our phone, there was something that if the phone saw we were using the phone too much, we would have to do you understand? Like, wouldn't that be kind of cool if the phone could actually help us not use the phone? Yeah. So there are apps out there that are like these nanny apps where like, they're like, oh, you've already reached 15 minutes. You can either ignore for today or you can, you know, ignore for now for another 15 minutes or whatever. Right. And when, uh, when people tell me they downloaded those apps, they tell me like three weeks later, they're like, oh, I, I uninstalled that in like three days. Like it was getting too annoying. So nanny apps uh, would help for a small percentage of people, but most people are looking for just cutting down, not really having uh, an eye on what you're doing uh, minute to minute. Great. Apple says, is there a personality type that is more prone to tech overuse and or addiction? Uh, I would say... You know, there are different ways of looking at it. Yes, the people who are more, you know, more extroverted, they are always, you know, they are going to like being on these things and get some attention. So that would be, they would be more uh, prone to social media. The people who are introverts uh, get more attracted to the gaming aspect because you can have this avatar, you can be anybody else in this internet reality. So I think as far as apps and games and other things are concerned, there is a, there is a flavor available for everyone. Oh boy, that's interesting. Uh, Elizabeth says, uh, what about sex addiction? Do you have to ever have to treat that? Yes. Yes. So we do see problematic, uh, you know, pornographic use in, uh, in my practice. And yes, the, 
uh, we there are some uh, options available for treatment for that. And especially from what I hear from the COVID year, people have gone up in their use of these apps. Is, is, is there something at the heart of all addiction, just like people looking for dopamine in all the wrong places? Yeah, so at the end of the day, it is this chronic relapsing remitting disease of the brain. It, addiction is one, whether it is a substance or a non-substance, at the end of the day, you, have, you are in this cyclical loop where you are, uh, you are using despite consequences. So that is the definition by the American Society of Addiction Medicine. It's a chronic relapsing remitting of the uh, disease of the brain, which can be treated just like any other chronic disease. But that is the most important part, it can be treated. Yeah. So uh, this is interesting. Apple says, do you remember when TV stations stopped broadcasting at midnight? Wouldn't that be cool if like all iPhones and all social, like if there was a time where it just shut down, you know, and there used to be a time where bars and liquor stores were closed, you know, but now we live in a 24 hour society now. Almost everything is 24 hours available. Absolutely. And yes, Apple, I think you, you, you know, you really nailed it because this is, we are used to the idea of being over busy. Right. If I have two phones, one for work, one for personal use, and I'm always busy emailing, doing this, doing that, it's kind of like this energy that you're almost running on fumes. And our uh, society has made us like that, like, oh, yes, I'm so important that I'm so busy or I'm so good, not important, but I'm so good at facilitating other people that I'm this busy and this is who I am. This is my job. I think it has become like this a part of our identities. Like unless I'm doing five different things at once, it's not our usual work day. We like being over busy and overtired. Um, and yes, not having boundaries is the number one problem. That's what addiction work is all about. Where do we draw, draw the line? Where are the boundaries? And uh, unfortunately, the boundaries are not enforced like that anymore. So we have, as a society, have to make that change happen. You need to come back and give a whole talk on boundaries, please, because this is so this is so important. Dale comments, as a teacher for over 35 years, I saw the difference between pre-tech days and how it affected the kids and their attention spans. Can kids even sit still for school anymore? Absolutely, Gail. So, you know, this brings me back in my in my job. So I am a family doc, right? So when I was in residency, I was in Minnesota. In six months of the year, it is, you know, in, in snow, if you don't know about Minnesota. And when I would see pediatric uh, patients for their well child check, you know, the parents would bring along an iPad or two to keep the child entertained so that I can even listen to their heart and lungs. Otherwise, the child will not sit. And then as uh, I got the opportunity to travel to Jamaica uh, to do pediatric work over there in their rural areas. And then I'm like, wow, these kids are able to interact without a device. I mean, that was like, okay, mind blown for three weeks for me. So definitely I see that also in my practice. And yes, uh, with more use of screens, you are prone to being less attentive. Inattention, in it, you know, being inattentive um, has become much more prevalent and everybody thinks that they have ADHD. Uh, that may not be the case. It is just plain old inattention. Right. Marcy says, I'm addicted to these live shows on YouTube, but as long as it's my channel, Marcy, I'll support you in that addiction. I'm just kidding. You know, I remember, <laughs> and again, these are really extreme cases, but I remember, and this was, I want to say Dr. Oz or Dr. Phil, I don't, I really stopped kind of watching TV a couple of years ago, but it was a kid that got so mad that when the parents took away his video game, he actually killed them. Yes, that happens, especially even with um, in India also over the last uh, couple of years, there have been reports of that in the Indian Southeast Asia in general with some of the games that were much more addictive. And like I said, when, uh, when it becomes a dual diagnosis where there's addiction plus a psychiatric comorbidity, you know, these things unfortunately happen and it's very sad. That's, uh, that's why I always tell parents who are like trying to moderate the use, don't take away the device because we don't know how dysphoric, how down in the dumps the patient, the, the child is going to feel. The amount of, uh, the amount of sadness uh, that comes with taking away the gaming is incredible. So what can we as a society do to feel good without technology? And I mean, not that we shouldn't have, you know, without addiction, how can we just feel like, what did they do in the old days? <laughs> yeah. So uh, very nice question. So, you know, if, 
it is a learning curve for everybody. You make a start somewhere. Okay. Then you have to know your why. Why am I doing this? Why do I even want to cut down? If you just, somebody tells you, hey, you should cut down X, Y, or Z, you'll be like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And you know, kind of like, absolutely. And go home and do what you're doing. Unless you have a why, you're never going to get to the other side of it. And then what is, what are your different whys as a family? Like there might be something that appeals to me, not to my spouse or, or something else that works for my kids. What are their motivations? So it's, it all starts with motivation and your why, and then you take it from there. And as far as, um, you know, where, where do we put, um, put a stop to this? I would say there should be a way to interact with technology in a way that makes you doing your, what, what is your job or what is your karma? Okay, doing better, feasible to do your karma, but it should not be that it should take a life of its own. So for example, like with these teenagers, right? So some families may have like, okay, you are only going to get say a flip phone or whatever policy and the other peers will have like the latest iPhone or whatever. And then you're setting this child up for like feeling inferior in some way. So these conversations need to happen like in your circle of friends. Are you all on board or on up to what extent are some of you on board so that there is like when, when you and your children hang out together, what is the idea with uh, media policy going to be? So there are some friends of mine who have older kids. They are like, everybody has to like put their phones in the bucket and actually sit down to eat family style. Like, it, you know, first food, with food, you need to disassociate uh, screens and like sit down together as a family and eat. Or you can say, hey, we are going to have a potluck at this park someday once things open back up. And, uh, you know, we are going to play these lawn games. So we are going to play these other things that are going to be more physically active. So you need to prepare for that. Keep, you know, uh, know what to expect. And, you know, as, as a group of friends, have some, some idea what to do. That's what we can do at this level. But overall, at, at a societal level, I think we are yet to see the changes. Um, and there are some reasons for that, but five or 10 years from now, we will be having different conversations than today. Wow. You know how, like when, when I was in Japan, like as a sign of respect, you take your shoes off before entering someone's house. Maybe I'll get one of those buckets and I'll make everybody put their cell phone in it before they come in my house from now on. How would that be? Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. you, know, when, you know, when I think about it, it's like, you know, there before the grace of God go, I, I think of myself as like, God, I'm so great. I don't watch TV anymore. And I got off of all social media, except for the hour I'm here a day. But I did find that like now I'm using my phone more. And I do, I play words with friends and I don't know if I'm addicted to it. I just like it because it helps me relax. But I mean, I don't have to be doing it. It's not like I'm going to ignore you to play, but there is, I, I see there's this pull and like, if I'm, it's just, I hate that feeling of something pulling me in like that. You know, I don't like that feeling of. So not many people are even going to get to that level of consciousness where you realize that it's pulling you. I think getting people there is going to be the bigger hurdle. But once people feel like, hey, this thing is trying to manipulate me, they are going to want to cut, cut it down. I think uh, that is absolutely vital. And, you know, as long as you're playing words with friends, like there are some, some tips and tricks how to negotiate technology. You know, first 15 minutes of the day, don't use any technology, just don't. And you will see that the rest of your day is going to go fine. Oh, that's a good idea. Cause that's usually the first thing I do is I look at the phone, mainly to just see what the weather is. I, but, but I don't have to do that. I could just ask Alexa what the, that's the other thing, Alexa. It's like, you know, I'm talking to her all the time because it's, I don't know. It's just, I think she's hilarious, but that is so funny. Diane says, are there withdrawals from using a phone too much? And maybe she means withdrawals from not using it, Diane. Is that what you mean? Or Probably. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So do you do feel kind of empty? That's the first thing you will have like, okay, I am cutting my phone down by 30 to 40%. And what do I do with this empty time? Because I like being busy. I like being over, uh, over involved in five or six different areas. What do I do with this emptiness? And also it, you know, it does make you feel a little sad initially, and it takes you a few days to kind of get over the first cut down. So that's why we go a little bit progressive with that. Um, so yes, you can have withdrawal, like, you know, feeling sad, feeling like there's nothing to do, fidgeting, you're going kind of wondering what to do with yourself. You know, there's this wonderful place in Mexico called Rancho La Puerta that I've had the privilege of teaching at the last 10 years. And I usually get about two weeks there a year and you can't use your cell phone there because it doesn't work. 
so you you're there for eight days and i mean you can make a call on the phone you know to call your husband like i do uh, and they have these centers with computers where you have wi-fi but they're really far to walk to and it's like so i mean there's like the best week of my life because i i can't be on it because it doesn't work you have to find other things to do like go within and do yoga and go for a hike and take a cooking class and it's like i wish everybody had that experience yeah, absolutely. Like uh, for me, Jamaica was like that for, for whatever reason, uh, the, my phone would not work over there. I would only get like very uh, tricky like internet use. And it was like a good three weeks to, you know, disconnect from everything and you know, uh, be connected with this beautiful tropical paradise that I was in. You know, it's funny. I, I had this experience. I was on the street at like a, a street that had stores on it. And this woman comes out of the store, she's holding her phone and she's screaming. And I thought, oh my God, like somebody died or whatever. And I'm like, what, what? And it was something that was wrong with the technology. Like, like she screamed as if like her daughter had died. And it was, that's how attached and upset people get when something wrong happens with their technology. Absolutely. Like uh, if something ha wrong happens with your technology, you kind of almost feel like you have no money in your pocket. Like, what am I going to do with my day? How am I going to find where I'm driving to? What, what do I do with Google's GPS, right? So, so many things that, that feel like it. And I wanted to also say that, uh, you know, when we were talking about words with friends, right, you were saying you, you like it. So one of the other things is you have to decide who is the decision maker? Is the words of friends the decision maker or are you? So if you are the decision maker, you will say, I'm going to use words with friends between five to six every evening, right? Okay. If words with friends is the decision maker in this scenario, you will be up, you get up to, you know, whatever, okay. uh, get up in the middle of the night and then you will be on words with friends like at 2 a.m. or 3 right. a.m. I don't do that. One of the things, and I learned this because I, I, my psychologist is Dr. Doug Lyle, who's a very well-known person in the plant-based world, is uh, I never have my notifications turned on. So I play when I feel like, like when, I'm, when I, I sit with my dog in the afternoon, it's too hot to go for a walk and we're sitting on the grass and I'll play. But otherwise I, I, you know, I have certain times, you know, but no, I wouldn't, I don't, I don't get up in the middle, but I, I could see how that could happen. You know, I hope you don't mind if I switch gears for a minute, because I didn't even ask you your story about being plant-based and that's important. I'm sure to you and to others as well. When did you start that journey? Wonderful. Uh, yes. Uh, so I have, I've, uh, you know, born and raised a vegetarian all my life. So always was, uh, it was always important to not harm other living beings you know, with my food practices. Uh, and that's something that was just ingrained to me at a, at a young age. And my journey with the whole food plant-based, I, I moved out here uh, in uh, rural California and I went to one of uh, uh, Dr. Lovenda's uh, uh, plans for life classes. And initially I was like, I can't do this the way how he's asking about, no, he wasn't presenting, somebody else was presenting. But I, first, day, first thought was, no, I can't do this. And then later on, it was like, it kept coming at me. Like my friends uh, went, went all plant-based and I'm like, okay, fine, I'll join you. And then later when I you know joined lifestyle medicine, I was like, this is amazing. One, it gives you power back from chronic diseases, it does not assume that, okay, you are this whole, uh, you know, moral failure person, like you, you are what, you know, where you got yourself to be from eating. And it also explores the role of processed food in our life. And that's kind of what's the most important, because when you look at, uh, you know, chronic diseases or obesity, we, in, in, in the usual medical terms, we are not looking at processed food that way. And how does, how is it affecting you? How is it affecting your weight, your inflammation, whatever. And that whole concept of having these six pillars uh, of, you know, nutrition, exercise, sleep, social connections, you know, avoiding risky sex, uh, substance use and, uh, and, you know, uh, stress reduction that really, called out to me. And that's kind of how I went plant-based and slowly, slowly started putting in uh, things that I can make more sustainably. Because if you say that, okay, for three weeks, I'm going to throw everything out of my pantry, it's never going to be sustainable. So I now am very drawn to what helps people make the change. And how, how do you go about doing that? How do you make it feasible and sustainable and affordable? Nice. Do you have an instant pot? Absolutely. I have an instant pot and I have three old fashioned pressure cookers. <laughs> That's great. Is, is your family, did they join you in your plant-based journey? 
Yes, yes, very much so. And, uh, you know, most people come, you know, say like, how can you do that? Well, it was, like I said, a negotiation slowly, but surely. And I have to say my husband has been my biggest supporter in making these changes. Oh, great. I, that's All credit great. to him. That's wonderful. <laughs> that is something we need you to talk about these negotiations, because it is hard for people. So Jeanette uh, brings something up that I hear uh, another wonderful speaker in the plant-based world, John Pierre, often talk about when he talks. She says, what about our culture of violence that has been normalized through technology? Video games have become so violent, and I wonder if it has influenced our youth negatively. So, you know, video games are of different ratings, right? So, like, not all of the video games are going to be that violent. Uh, and, you know, generally, people, children are aware that they are playing violent games, but uh, is that gone into, like, is this causative for being more violent in your daily life? I think that needs to yet be proven. We need to have some studies looking into that. Yeah, that's interesting. So what's good about technology? <laughs> so many things, right? Uh, I, you know, like if a month in the ICU and you'll know what is good about technology, all these miraculous life-saving techniques that you're seeing, these machines, even your ventilators, like I know ventilators were so talked about last year, right? They are all pieces of fantastic technology. Like I have used the ventilators here in the US. And then when I was doing my medical education in India, I've used the old fashioned ventilators with those knobs on them. And every time, like I had to like literally sit next to the patient, unfortunately on the ventilator, every time the power would go, we would have to quickly change to like a different bag and like start bagging by hand until we could get the power back in like rural India. Like, oh my goodness. Like these technologies have definitely helped people live longer. Yeah. So what advice do you have for us? And, and you know, is there a test to take to see, you know, there's tests you can take to see like if you're, addicted to alcohol is there do we just know or do, do people tell us like you know you're on your phone too much you gotta get off that phone and you know they think about texting and driving and you know there's just there's just so many things that are so many levels of this right texting and crossing the road texting and driving you know having negative consequences so first the easiest test is what are your negative consequences are you having significant negative consequences then there is a problem you need to talk about it are there tests there are some screening tests available online unfortunately for internet use there hasn't been a specific test that has been agreed on but uh, there are there's a young's internet test that you could take now for gambling and gaming, there are uh, criteria are better uh, established. So for a gambling disorder, if you have persistent use of gambling and it could be device associated gambling, right? Before you used to have to go to a casino and gamble. Now you have an app in your phone then you can gamble every 15 seconds, correct? So if you have uh, gambling issues for more than 12 months and there are a list of criteria that are available, uh, if you meet them, then yes, you have a gambling issue. But I would instead of just taking any test at face value, you should have a real evaluation by somebody who knows because everything can seem like an addiction and it's not. It might just be, most of the cases are going to be overuse. And uh, as far as gaming disorder is concerned, currently it's not recognized in the US. So it's like, uh, uh, okay, something that we need to study more. But interestingly, what happened recently was the WHO has started recognizing gaming disorder and we have this thing called international classification of diseases. So they're coming out with the 11th version next year. So as of January, 2022, there it will be a part of ICD-11. And what that means is throughout the world, different countries will have to start making resources available for gaming disorder. So the conversation is, has just begun and we are going to get more help with people with over, overuse of games. Yeah, Elizabeth says, can you be addicted to fun? Depends on what your definition of fun is. Uh, if, if you are talking about fun as in, uh, you know, um, I went hiking for an hour or two, then that's okay. Right. If your definition of fun is using a substance to have fun, to party, uh, yes, that's a problem. You're not addicted to fun. You're addicted to the substance. Right? Right. So I just, I still want to know, like, how do we get the, the feeling that we're getting from these addictions? Can we get them in a way that is not addictive? 
but there's a lot of work to do it that way, right? Being mindful, exercise, you know, it seems like there's a, a lot of work involved. Right, right. And uh, yes, so the six pillars of lifestyle medicine, like I said, eating a whole food plant-based diet, being, you know, basically being one with nature. Why are we saying whole food plant-based diet? Because we are going closer to nature, right? You're eating things that you can identify, exercising, you want to have less stress, you have to have more sleep, you want to build more social connections and have decreased substance use. So they, these are all ways of ha- being more present in real life or IRL as it, know, as it is known. We have, we have to stop being present on the phones and be present in your real life. And more than that, like who, you, we need, all need to decide, like right? uh, define who we are. And that cha- definition changes every six months or so, but what are we doing? And the best way to have a positive feedback is to help others. I think the more you give back, uh, the better it is for you. It's not like, oh, I'm doing somebody else a favor, but say you're doing some volunteering, you're doing something else to help other people. It is for you because you are improving as a person. I'm sure you've heard the saying, genetics loads the gun, but it's your lifestyle that pulls the trigger. Probably, you've probably heard that. Yes. Because earlier we said that even if people are more susceptible to addictions or genetically prone to them, that doesn't mean they'll manifest. Because I remember I had a friend once who was an alcoholic and she said, it's not her fault because both her parents were alcoholics. And of course, it's not her fault that she has those genes, but it then knowing that it was probably her responsibility to never take that first drink. You know what I mean? So uh, that's an interesting question. So we talk about genetics, but if you grew up with uh, parents who have excessive alcohol use, you basically, your coping skills are around that. How do I avoid being in the way of their, you know, their anger or their effusive love or whatever that is. And unfortunately, the environment that you grew up in and the adverse childhood uh, experiences that you have no control over have a much bigger part to play. And that's a significant role of trauma in that. So it's probably the trauma that comes from being in that situation that leads you to using uh, substances heavily. You know, when I think about the kids, I know they've never had sugar like Dr. Goldhammer's son. They don't have a problem with their weight or their food. And it seems like if it would be better to never have been exposed to certain things. I think about my neighbor across the street, Gordon, he's 81 and he has a flip phone and he got an iPhone for one day and it was so frustrating. He returned it. And he seems to just have like a much happier life, not having an iPhone. And I remember when I got my iPhone, it wasn't my choice. I, I had a flip phone and I was about to go to Mexico to teach at Rancho. And the day before it broke and they said, well, we can replace this, but it'll be a week. And my husband didn't want me to go out of the country without a phone. So they gave me that iPhone. And it's like, now, it's like we have such a love-hate relationship you know what I mean because at some point I wish I had never had one but now I can't live without it and when it's not charged or when I can't find it I feel anxiety yeah yeah so you know as far like I said with food is concerned right with food it's like how it's this idea of abstinence it doesn't get to get you too far because it's like I you don't want to have all of these ideas like you tell a teenager not to do something what are they going to do do it going to do it Right. So you need to have like uh, you need to have an approach as to why am I doing this? What is the purpose it's going to serve and how is it going to help me use this body for my this particular experience of doing my work better? That's always going to be the case. So now with the iPhone, yes, you know, same. I have a very similar story. I had a flip phone and then my husband bought me one and he's like, we are changing it. And I'm like, I like my flip phone because whatever reason. And uh, yeah, so this, that's kind of how I have, have my, my own phone that way. And yes, you have to have kind of, you have to have some introspection, like what are you doing? What are your number of hours? And if you don't know, just turn on the screen time, the basic apps that, yeah, that are available both for Android and this and see where you are at. And does that mean we all should go back to a flip phone? I don't think so. Right. There should be a better way of doing it. And, you know, what we have done with our trials is uh, we've had you know, tremendous success. People have had become more mindful. I still get messages from the people who did the initial uh, challenges. They're like, oh, my screen time is still down by 30 percent. And I'm so much mindful because every time you unlock, you know, you have to ask yourself, like, what are you feeling? Where is that tension? Is you're holding that tension in your neck, in your shoulders where you are even for that one second of unlocking the phone if you are more mindful you you will start doing things differently because uh, you know are you using it to feel 
good about yourself or you're just using it to not feel bad about something. If you even bring that much mindfulness, it's going to change the game. That's interesting. That's something we all can do. You know, ever since Audible was created, I don't even read a book anymore. It's like, it's like I forgot how to read. It's too hard to read. There's too much effort, you know, when the, somebody reads to me. Yeah, yeah. I hear that a lot about Audible, like, you know, walk and talk or, uh, you know, walk and listen or run and listen. Uh, that's fine if that's the way you sneak in a book into your day. Personally, when I like to go for a walk, uh, you know, I, I do kind of do it 50-50 because, you know, you need to see the trees, you need to see the birds, you need to see the grass growing, you need to be in that moment and, you know, empty your mind of other nonsense so that uh, you, your brain gets a break. You, you know, like with tobacco, they, at some point, the tobacco industry became accountable for the dangerous product they created. There were lawsuits and they're talking about doing the same thing with the processed food industry. What, what about this industry? Like, will, will they ever become accountable? Very interesting. So a uh, little tidbit. So with the tobacco, the landmark settlement, right? It's almost as if that, settle, that kind of settlement we may not be able to see again. But uh, they had to set up this uh, museum of sorts of the stuff that they were able to salvage from these tobacco companies and the advertisements like Virginia Slims, you smoke this, you're going to have this model figure or whatever. Right. All of that. So as a part of my MPH, I was actually able to go there and like do more study of that. And it was fascinating, really fascinating how such a public health victory was achieved. Definitely. Uh, on the technology part, I think the science has lagged behind the technology because uh, these people who are making these addictive devices know a lot more than those of us at the other end who have to prove everything that we are doing. Um, at the same time, I see this increasing push for like digital wellness from these big tech companies themselves. They are all understanding that they need to at least appear to do work in this field. And so that's why you have these screen time apps or well-being apps available that are, you know, they are not that useful, but at least they are trying to do something about it. Well, it's kind of like nuclear energy. It can be used for good or it could be used for evil. Absolutely. Wow, this has just been a wonderful conversation. I just really want you back to talk about that boundary issue. That I think that would be helpful to so many people, people even watching today. How can we support your work? Where can we hang out with you? Oh, talk thank you. Uh, so please uh, follow me on Twitter at Kanabar MD, and you can always uh, contact me for any questions that you may have at my website, uh, www.mitikakanabar.com, and it'll be linked. And yes, if you would like to have the beta version of the screen win app, please, uh, please sign up. Very much looking forward to it, and it'll be a free experience for you. Oh, that'll be amazing. Thank you. It's just such so, so wonderful meeting you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me here today, Chef AJ. I'm a big fan. And oh. uh, this has been just wonderful. Well, I'm a big fan of you now. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when we have another brand new to you and me, wonderful lifestyle medicine doctor. This has been such a treat this week meeting nine new doctors. Thank you so much. Thank you.